I'll start with a slide from somebody else. This was just presented at the Society for Information Display, Display Week 2014, uh, very recently. It was a keynote by Sony's uh, Dr. Kasumasa Nomoto, and he put up this pentagram of different parameters of uh, image quality. So there's temporal resolution, there's spatial resolution, there's quantization, uh, there's color gamut, and there's contrast. And although he didn't say this, you can see from the way the pentagram is kind of designed, we go from a uh, quarter of standard definition to standard definition to 2K to 4K to 8K in the spatial resolution and so on. Now, where did this demand for higher resolution come from? Well, this is a diagram that Ari came out with around the turn of the millennium. Um, and they're showing a movie theater with a 25 meter screen. And if you just work out the trigonometry for 2020 vision, then it seems to demand that you need to go way beyond HD resolution. Everything within the green triangle um, can see up to 8K resolution on the screen. Everything within the red triangle can see up to 4K resolution on the screen. And even in the back row of the cinema, everything within the blue triangle can see up to 3K resolution on the screen. So here we go. We have to have higher resolution. Or do we? This is a list of the top grossing movies of 2013. A um, bunch of them were shot on film, which as we all know is dead. Uh, some of them were animated, but of the ones that were shot with digital cinematography cameras, the top two, the number two movie of the year and the number seven movie of the year, were shot with the Ari Alexa camera. And it's not till we get down to the eighth and tenth movies that we get to higher resolutions. Now the Ari Alexa has 2880 pixels across. That's less than 3K resolution, and yet people are using that camera to shoot the top grossing movies, and I hope to explain a little more about that later. Here is a screen at a booth at the recent NAB show in April. This is Ericsson's booth, and one of the biggest questions that everyone asks when they see a screen that might be 4K is, is that 4K? Now, why should they have to ask that question? I'll get into that a little later, too. A little caution about what I'm going to be telling you today. I obviously can't properly show you here resolution or frame rate or image dynamics or color. The source material matters tremendously. You can always pick something that's going to either show off or show up something. Uh, and the viewing conditions matter. Screen size, viewing distance, and the display, how bright the display is, how much contrast, the uh, viewing area, and so on. At the right, you see typical home television viewing condition, nominally 2.7 meters or 9 feet. That's based on a survey that uh, Bernie Lechner, who died earlier this year, uh, did of employees at RCA Laboratories, and he just found that's how their furniture was arranged. But you'll have to admit that there is some distance, some viewing distance, at which the resolution doesn't matter. So here's 4K from 40,000 feet. Can we see the difference between 4K and HD? Can we see that there's even a television set down there? No. So at some distance, it doesn't make any difference at all. The question is, where is that distance and what happens as we start approaching it? Also, let me point out that whatever the home viewing distance is, it varies, even with constant furniture positions. So the top left picture is someone who's relaxed, watching some nice love story or whatever. The bottom left picture is someone who's all excited, edge of the seat, who's going to win the race. And the green line that you see there is a yardstick. So uh, there's almost a meter of difference between the upper picture and the bottom picture in terms of viewing distance. And then at the top right, I'm showing someone shopping for a TV. People who shop for TVs always are closer than they're going to be at home when they watch them. So you can see something in the store that you won't necessarily see at home. So here's viewing distance at the NAB show recently. This is at NHK's booth. 
and they had a very large uh, 8K monitor, and then they put those little footprints on the floor to tell you where you should stand to watch that monitor. Uh, if you put a couch there, your knees would be hitting the cabinet. So a lot of talk about 4K. What is 4K? According to the European Broadcasting Union, it's four degrees above absolute zero. <laughs> they say that's the only meaning if it's a capital K. Um, other people say, well, it might be 4,096 pixels across by 3072 down, or it might be 4096 across by 2048 down, or 4096 across by 2160 down, or maybe it's 3840 by 2160, which is sometimes called quad HD because it's four times the resolution of HD, twice the resolution vertically and horizontally. The consumer electronics industry has adopted the term UHD for that, or ultra high definition. Uh, the reason they did that is if they called TV sets 4K and they were just 3840, then somebody was going to bring a lawsuit. So no calling it 4K uh, except in uh, informal settings like this one. But ultra high definition also applies to 7680 by 4320, which is sometimes called 8K. It also may include higher frame rates. It may include higher dynamic range. It may include a wider color gamut, and it may include immersive sound. It may even be stereoscopic 3D. How about a camera? What is a 4K camera? Is a single color filtered 4K sensor truly 4K? And how much resolution does that sensor have to have? There are cameras on the market that are called 4K cameras with sensors ranging from 8 megapixels to 20 megapixels. So here's a common HD field and camera lens combination. The brands here happen to be Grass Valley and Fujinon, but it could be Sony and Canon, doesn't matter, there's lots of possibilities. And going from the right, we have a typical long range zoom lens used for sports, concerts, and things like that. Then there's a very standardized mount to put that lens onto the camera. There's optical filtering. There's a dichroic prism with three identical resolution sensors, and then the video signal comes out of the camera. So let's start with that lens on the right. Here are two new lenses that were introduced at the NAB show this year, uh, both from Fujinon. Um, similar ranges. The one on the right is a new video lens, a handheld lens. Uh, it's an 18 by 5.5 in video terminology, which means it goes out to 99 millimeters for two-thirds inch format. The equivalent of that for super 35 millimeter film frame, and I'll emphasize in a moment why I'm saying super 35 millimeter, would be 14 to 254 millimeters. At the left is a new Cabrio Premier lens. It goes from 25 millimeters to 300, so covers pretty much the same range as the lens on the right. Doesn't get quite as uh, wide, but it gets a little bit tighter. And the two-thirds equi equivalent of that would be a 12 by 9.8, uh, but it's a 12 to 1 zoom. That lens is the greatest zoom range lens that exists for a PL mount. And that is what people are putting on 4K cameras. So you don't have the option of using a lens like that when you're shooting sports, when you're shooting concerts, that sort of thing. So what do you do? <clears throat> oh, uh, by the way, about that super 35 millimeter frame, uh, PL mount image sensors come in wildly different sizes even if they all have the same resolution. So at right, I'm showing a small portion of a chart from Abel Cine of fields of view. The yellow field of view is what a super 35 millimeter uh, frame would do, and then the blue is what the camera sensor would do. And you can see at the top that the Canon 5D or 1D uh, have a much greater field of view than the 35 millimeter, and down at the bottom, the Blackmagic Design Cinema Camera has a much smaller field of view than 35 millimeter. So what do you do if you need a long zoom? Well, the camera manufacturers say, no problem, just use an adapter. So you get one of those long zoom lenses you're using for HD at the moment. Well, a couple of problems with that. First, the lens is designed for HD. So its performance at 4K is not going to be as great as its performance at 
uh, HD is. But the second thing is you have to somehow connect that to the camera. So you need an adapter. So the thing in the middle is an adapter. Now, if that adapter is absolutely optically perfect, it cannot be made any better uh, no matter how much you pay for it, no matter who works on it, then you will have about a 2.6 stop light loss. And that's for a perfect adapter. That's assuming no ill effect on the image whatsoever. And it says it compensates for different color depths. I'll explain the different color depths in a moment. On the right is an adapter that has less of a light loss, and it can be used to put one of these lenses on some of the Sony cameras that have a crop mode that uh, goes from 4K down to 2K, but if it's 2K, then you know why bother? Why not use the lens on an HD camera? So here's that color depth issue. Uh, this is that very defined standard for mounting a lens on a two-thirds inch HD camera. And the lens and camera manufacturers got together and said, sorry, but we can't make all three of the colors show up in the same place. So the green shows up in one plane, the blue is five microns behind that, the red is 10 microns behind the green. Uh, that's not even the way you would expect it to go based on the spectrum, but that's the best they could do. So that's what those HD lenses are designed for. The adapter has to compensate for that. Now here's what's inside one of those HD lenses. This has about 36 elements in four groups. The first group is the focus group, what focuses on what you're shooting. The next is the magnification group or the zooming group, it's called the variator. Uh, the next is the compensator, which maintains the focus while you're zooming. And then the last is the relay that simply takes the image and puts it on the sensor. Well, there's seven elements just in that relay section. So now you're going to take an adapter that's going to have, what, another self seven elements on it and something for compensating for the color depth. And each of those elements is going to have a certain amount of reflection. Each of them is going to introduce a certain amount of distortion in the image. And you're starting with an HD lens and you're going to end up with 4K? I don't know. So here's a new 4K camera that was introduced at the NAB show this year, Aja camera. Uh, there was a lot of Blank makes cameras at the NAB show. Aja makes cameras. Um, Marshall makes cameras. Belden makes cameras. Anyway, uh, here's a section of the brochure on the right for the camera, and I apologize for the little dirt there. That's my scanner. That's not their brochure. And it says that they have an optical low-pass filter for reducing the aliasing. And my question is, how do you do that? Because this is the kind of sensor that they have in it. It's a single sensor that's color filtered. All of the 4K cameras have a single sensor that's color filtered with the exception of one prototype I'll tell you about in a moment. Um, and if you look at the colors individually, that's the three squares at the top there, the red is simply a 2K imager. The blue is simply a 2K imager. The green is more than a 2K imager, but it's not a full uh, 4K imager. It's a quincunx 4K imager. And so there's all kinds of aliases that you can have. Now, if you optically filter this, for the red or the blue, then you've filtered too much for the green. If you optically filter it for the green, then you haven't filtered enough for the red or the blue. You cannot optically filter a color-filtered camera like this properly. It just can't be done. Uh, so at the bottom, I have a quote way back in 2008 from uh, Peter Senton, who's the chief camera design guy for Grass Valley, and he says, uh, if the DALSA and RED1 4K cameras are 4K, then the Panavision Genesis and the Sony F23, old cameras, you may not even remember them now, which had color stripes, are 6K. At least that's the way that he describes it. Here, by the way, is what happens if the color filtering uh, isn't removed properly, and uh, it's kind of difficult. That's not a fence that has different colors on it. That's just the way the camera is portraying that fence. Now, it is possible to make a 4K camera the same way that we make HD cameras. Just use a sensor that has enough pixels on it. Um, take three of those, do the processing. There's one that was actually built. You see it on the left there. It's quite a large camera because it had very large sensors. Each sensor was larger than a frame of IMAX film. Um, and the reason they did that is 
4K means more sensors or more uh, sensor points on your sensor, and therefore they're smaller. That's why I started this calling it smaller pixels. Most people will say more pixels. But I want to emphasize that for any given size sensor, the more resolution you have, the smaller the image points are. And the camera had pretty good performance, very similar to film. Well, here's a camera that was introduced at the NAB show this year. It's from Grass Valley, uh, introduced just as a prototype, but you can see on the side of the camera it does say 4K. It's a three-chip prism-based camera, so, you know, could this be like the camera that I just showed you before? True 4K was possible. You don't necessarily have to have any color filtering loss, but they happen to be using the Sensium FT high-definition sensors, so it's an HD camera as far as the optics and the sensors are concerned. It's not a 4K camera, but it says 4K on the side. And because it's a prism-based camera, because the sensors are all in the right place, it means that you can up-convert easier than you could from one that has those sensors in different places, the spaces between them, and so on. You don't have the artifacts. It's like the difference between interlace and progressive, if you will. It's easier to upconvert progressive than interlace. So there are benefits that Grass Valley uh, has from that. Uh, you can get improved filtering and uniformity, and therefore the 4K output from it might actually be better than the 4K output from some of the other cameras. It is a two-thirds inch format camera. So you can use before mount lenses with no light loss. Uh, what the modulation transfer function or the contrast is going to be at 4K, that's a different issue. So if you want to shoot 4K, there are certain benefits if you're going to deliver HD. You can reframe in post. You can do image stabilization in post. There is easier filtering because you have oversampling. You can possibly do stereoscopic 3D on a single sensor. Uh, like the ZPAR lenses on a Phantom 65. You might even get some increased sharpness. Down conversion, absolutely good, all else being equal. This is one of the most basic digital filters. If you sample something, you have to filter it. This is a sine X over X or sync function filter. And the numbers at the bottom there are just arbitrary, but if number 11 happened to be HD resolution, let's say that's 1080 lines, then the contrast at 1080 lines is zero. But if number 11 is 2160 lines, the 4K number, then the contrast at 1080 lines or HD is 64%. Well, 64% is a lot better than zero, so there is a value to oversampling. But extraction, not necessarily as good. A lot of people are saying, okay, we'll shoot 4K, and because that's twice as many pixels, we can do effectively a two-to-one zoom in and extract an HD picture from that. But here is a hypothetical modulation transfer function for a lens. It's pretty good at HD, like 90% contrast coming through. Uh, not so good at 4K the way I've drawn it here. It's maybe 40% at 4K. Well, if you're simply down converting to HD, that's great. You're getting uh, all of the contrast. But if you're going to extract, then you're up in that right side of the curve. And now you're where there's not much contrast when you do that two-to-one zoom. Here's another camera that was introduced at NAB this year. It's the Sony Alpha 7S. It uh, can do 4K with an external recorder. It has a color-filtered sensor like I showed you, but it's a full-frame sensor. Full-frame is twice the size of a super 35-millimeter uh, movie frame but it's only 12 megapixels, which means that it has very, very large pixels. The advantage of the very, very large pixels, it's very sensitive. So remember when you had film and you had ISO 100 film or 200 or 400 and high-speed film was ISO 800? The equivalent ISO for this camera that Sony gives it is 409,600. So a very, very sensitive camera. But the reason that it's sensitive is that the pixels are very large because it's an extremely large sensor, much larger than in typical 4K cameras. Here's some Blackmagic design stuff that was shown at NAB this year. Uh, the top left is their new digital cinematography camera called the Ursa. The top middle is their new studio camera. The top right is a new conversion product they have, Terranex Express. The bottom left is their new 
4K switcher, uh, ATEM 2ME production switcher. The middle is their uh, new 4K routing switcher, and then the right is their new 4K deck link cards. But there's a problem. Everything on the top row puts out 12G SDI, which is what's necessary for doing 60 frame per second 4K. Everything on the bottom can accept only 6G SDI, which is only 30 frame per second. Um, so even within one company, you cannot connect the camera to the production switcher. It simply doesn't work. So a little recap on 4K. Uh, on the positive side, down conversion to HD. Great. Reframing, stabilizing in post for HD, and possible stereoscopic 3D on one sensor. Against it, currently less sensitive, no long zooms for the PL mount. It requires eight times the data uncompressed because if you're going from 720p or 1080i to 4K, first thing you have to do is deinterlace the 1080i, so that's two factor of two, and then it's four times the number of pixels. And no connection standard yet. But I haven't yet told you about what happens at the other end, at the home. Now, is there any pressure on you to change to 4K? Well, the manufacturers would like to put a lot of pressure on you to change to 4K. Uh, but here's another booth at NAB. This is the Utilsat booth, and this is what they said. They're proudly broadcasting more than 5,000 TV channels, of which 500 are in high definition. And I'll give you a hint. The other more than 4,500 are not 4K. So here's some stuff that came from somebody else. This is a, a reporter for CNET, uh, Jeffrey Morrison. And back in October of 2012, when people were just starting to talk about 4K, he said, boy, you know, here's three TV improvements that are more worthwhile than Ultra HD 4K. And then just this March, he said that the push for Ultra HD 4K forces picture quality trade-offs. Now, that might be related to that data rate that I just told you about. The pre-compression, post-compression data rate for 4K is eight times the data for HD. Um, if you then want to add other improvements, maybe you don't have any data left. But let's look at those different improvements. Let's start with the 4K. These are data that were shown by the European Broadcasting Union at the Hollywood Post Alliance Tech Retreat in 2013. They're based on a 56-inch screen, um, six different samples of viewing material, a bunch of different viewers and they did two different distances. The red line is 2.7 meters, or theoretical, typical home viewing distance. The black line is 1.5 times the picture height, um, which for uh, a 56-inch screen is um, a little over a meter. So very, very close viewing. And what they found was, yes, there is unquestionably an improvement. So anyone who says you can't see 4K at home, they're lying. There is an improvement, and it's a, st a statistically significant improvement. But at the typical home viewing distance, that's the red line, it's about a third of a grade of improvement. And even when you're watching it from only a meter away, um, you're getting a half a grade of improvement. So not a lot of improvement for eight times the data. We are at an event of SIMPTI, and I don't know how often you think about what the letters stand for, but one of the letters of SIMPTI is M, and the M stands for motion. We are in the motion picture business, not the static picture business. So why are we even talking about static resolution? Here's some dynamic resolution. What happens when we add motion? Now, this is stuff that was shot by the BBC using a camera at 300 frames per second and essentially no shutter or a 360-degree shutter. Um, so uh, because it was no shutter, they were able to add frames and simulate what it would have been like at 50 frames per second. Notice that the tracks and the ties have identical resolution, but the locomotive certainly does not because the locomotive was moving. That's what happens with motion pictures. So dynamic resolution is a much more important issue. So here's another chart that the European Broadcasting Union came up with. This they showed at the International Broadcasting Convention last September in Amsterdam. 
And uh, this is five sequences of very different material. This is motion heavy material. So this might be sports or dancing with the stars or something like that. Again, lots of different viewers. And this time what we find is for every doubling of the frame rate, we get a full grade of improvement. So compared to the uh, 4K improvement, 4K was 16 times the data rate per grade. This is one, uh, two times the data rate per grade. They also found that those 50% things there are going to a 50% shutter, and there's an effect that we're not really sure about yet because it hasn't been examined, but it appears that when you get to frame rates above 100, you can use more of a shutter because motion shutter doesn't seem to be as much of an issue. Uh, but that's going to need a little bit more study. So how about high dynamic range? There was a debate at IBC in September, and one of the speakers at the debate said, a 4K display delivers the best HD you've ever seen. And this is a common statement because of the oversampling of the display. So then I took that person over to the ARI booth where they had some images from an Alexa that were shown on side-by-side -side displays. One of them was 4K, one of them was high dynamic range, and he said, okay, I take it back. The high dynamic range HD display looked a lot sharper than the 4K display because sharpness is a function not only of resolution but also of contrast. High dynamic range can also increase picture detail because it reduces clipping. Uh, and consumer TVs already have more dynamic range than reference monitors or the way that reference monitors are used. Again, contrast contributes to sharpness and uh, higher resolution can result in reduced contrast because of that thing I was showing you with the smaller pixels. So here's a compromise that was done in early camcorders. <clears throat> you may remember when HD cam first came out. HD cam had only 1440 pixels uh, per line, active pixels per line in Luma rather than 1920. So they threw away a quarter of the resolution. Significant loss of resolution. But because sharpness is proportional depending on which school you believe, either to the area under a curve mapping contrast against resolution or the square of the area under the curve, um, they lost sharpness only where the toe is, and the toe has very, very low uh, area under the curve. The shoulder of the curve is where most of the sharpness is coming from, and that's how they could get away with creating HD cam. So what happens if we could simply increase the contrast at the finer detail, go to a better lens, better filter, something like that? We're now increasing the sharpness significantly. We're adding a significant amount more area under the curve, whereas if we continued the curve out farther, if we continued that yellow line to 4K, 8K, whatever, we're adding very, very little additional sharpness. And if we go to true high dynamic range, if we increase the contrast over the entire range, even um, things that have very limited detail, then we're adding even more area to the curve and we're making it even sharper. So how much data rate does it require for us to um, increase the dynamic range? Well, theoretically, none, because the bit depth simply determines the signal to noise ratio. Every additional bit you have is simply another 6 dB of signal to noise ratio if the least significant bit is uh, at least half noise. But practically, because people don't uh, follow the noise issues carefully enough, don't convolve noise into signals when they multiply them, it causes contouring. And the contouring is halved per bit. And it's eliminated when the least significant bit, again, has um, one half of it being noise. So let's say we go to 12 bits, which would be a quarter of the contouring over 10 bits. That would be a 20% increase in data rate. And let's say high dynamic range only increases the impact by half a grade of improvement. Well, that would be 40% per grade, 40% increase versus 200% uh, increase for high frame rate or 1,600% increase for 4K. Um, so this may be something that provides the most impact. But 
there are some problems. By the way, this was shown at NAB this year at the Simpty Technology Summit for Cinema. Uh, two organizations showed this, the European Broadcasting Union and the uh, Ecole Polytechnique uh, in Lausanne in Switzerland, and their results were very, very close. Um, and they're showing what seems to be a tremendous improvement for going to increased brightness on the display and higher dynamic range. This is something that Dolby has been pushing very hard. There are four organizations actually pushing this high dynamic range, uh, BBC, Dolby, uh, Philips, and Technicolor. And um, I mentioned before, I can't possibly show you what this looks like here, but at the left, let's say, is the monitor that your color grader looks at, your video operator in a truck or your uh, post-production person doing the color grading, it's a 100 nit reference standard. Uh, Dolby has a special monitor that does 4,000 nits and it's pretty amazing to look at. But consumer TVs are already in the range of 450 to 900 nits and down at the bottom I have a commercial product from Samsung that's available that's 1,500 nits. So we're already beyond in the home where we are in the color grading suite. And Dolby has shown some demos that are very interesting where they have two identical consumer monitors, both of them exactly the same brightness, exactly the same capability of dynamic range, but one of them is fed a signal that was graded on a high dynamic range monitor, and one is fed a signal that was graded on a standard definition monitor, and there's pretty spectacular difference between the two. But there's interactivity among this stuff. So at the right, I'm showing you a chart that appeared in a paper from the uh, University of California, Berkeley's Visual Space Perception Laboratory. And the temporal frequency, or the frame rate, is the x-axis. The spatial frequency, uh, or the resolution, is the vertical axis. And the circle that you see in the middle, the black circle, um, that's what's visible. That's what you can see. And the desired thing is what I've put a red uh, oval around. That's the signal you want to see. Now, all of those other lines are temporal aliases, things that you don't want to see. But notice that they're not all black. They fade off to gray. And the ones that fade to gray um, have less perceptibility just as you can't see things as they get fainter and fainter. So there's an advantage to the dimness in a motion picture theater and the low contrast that we get at home. It reduces the visibility of motion judder. So if you see some of the Dolby demonstrations, the first impression you have is, oh, wow, you know, look, that's amazing. I'm seeing all that um, spectacular dynamic range for the first time. And then your second impression is, hmm, I'm seeing a lot more motion judder than I'm accustomed to seeing. So even going to higher dynamic range might require us to go to a higher frame rate. Now down at the bottom left, I'm showing you a chart of a theoretical vertical line that we want to go across the screen unaliased. So if we take the number of pixels in 720p HDTV, it's 1280, and we divide that by the frame rate, that's how long it should take this to go across the screen. So 720p um, type HDTV at 120 frames per second to have something unaliased go across the screen should take it 10.7 seconds. Now if we do 4K at 60 frames per second, that's 68.3 seconds. That's more than a minute to cross the screen unaliased. If we do it at 30 frames per second, which is what those Blackmagic design uh, devices at the bottom row could do, that's 137 seconds. That's well over two minutes. Um, so we're going to get a lot of motion aliasing if we don't go to higher frame rates. But going to higher frame rates might be very nice in a number of ways. How about wider color gamut? Well, here's another demonstration that was done at the uh, Hollywood Post Alliance Tech Retreat. And if you look at the picture on the left, but the right side of it, you see some yarn and it's being shot by a camera. And uh, notice there's two monitors, and the monitor at the left is supposed to be a conventional monitor, and it's showing the color all wrong, and the monitor at the right is a Genoa Color uh, Technologies monitor, which has multiple primaries, and it's showing the color just right. And so you go, wow, you know, that's an amazing demonstration. Look at the difference between those two colors. 
except you're looking at a screen now that has only three color primaries and you're seeing it on there. So take the demonstration with a grain of salt. Also, going to uh, more color primaries can affect resolution, as you can see at the bottom. And again, the source material matters. Um, so yes, we could get a particular hank of yarn or a particular color of a cigarette pack or something that uh, can't be reproduced. But in general, it's not going to make that much of a difference. Here, I've got some stuff that's been decoded wrong. So the image on the bottom left um, was shot, encoded at 601, and was decoded at 709. Uh, the one on the right was shot at 709 and decoded at 601. And the one in the middle is what it's supposed to be like. Yeah, you know, you can see it's a little yellower on the right and a little more orange on the left. But is this going to bother people at home? And finally, here's something that appeared in the SIMTI uh, Motion Imaging Journal uh, last November, December. And they were talking about the SIMTI convention last October. And here's uh, Executive Director uh, Barbara Lang. And she says, the overwhelming response from attendees was that faster and better pixels, better pixels meaning higher dynamic range, are more desirable than uh, what people were calling more pixels, which I call smaller pixels. So again, to sum up from the European Broadcasting Union UHD roadmap at IBC, uh, 4K has a limited viewing range. The viewing distance, very important. Maximum half grade impact based on the material they showed. Uh, higher frame rate, higher dynamic range, wider color gamut, immersive sound have no limit on where you perceive that. So you can just walk into a room and have the TV at the other end and uh, immediately see that improvement. And again, the PN the uh, pre and post compression data rates, uh, 4K eight times the data rate from either 1080i or 720p, higher frame rate, two times the data rate, or if you're starting with interlace, let's say four times the data rate, and then higher dynamic range, wider color gamut, and immersive sound, minimal increases in data rate from what we're doing today. Any questions? So make a statement about what your dream format would be. What resolution, what uh, frame rate? Uh, um, what do you think we should all do? I don't know about the resolution yet, but I don't think we have to go higher than what we have now. Um, a homework assignment for all of you, and I've given this to Charles Poynton earlier today. There's an artist whose name is James Nares, N-A-R-E-S, and he's done an artwork called Street. And what he did was he took a vision research HD resolution camera, stuck a telephoto lens on it, put it in a side window of a car, and drove through New York City at 30 miles an hour. And then he slowed down the images and turned it into an hour-long artwork. Uh, the hour-long artwork is currently at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, but there's one-minute excerpts that you can get on YouTube or some other video on the web and look at it, and it looks like some of the sharpest images you've ever seen, but it's only HD, and it's because of that dynamic resolution. So I would say we need to go to a higher frame rate. Exactly what that frame rate is, I don't know, and as I said, we're still playing with going to shorter shutter speeds at something above 100, but you know, something between 100 and 300 frames per second. 300 is a nice, friendly number for uh, world television standards. Um, so we want to do that. We definitely want to have the people who are grading the pictures using higher dynamic range monitors than they're currently using. Uh, home TVs in excess of 400 nits already. Uh, I've seen the 4,000 nit monitor and it's pretty amazing, but it's also water cooled. Um, so that's not going to be in my home for a while. Um, I'd say, you know, HD resolution, higher frame rate, and get the graders to use high dynamic range. That's my roadmap. Yes, Carl. As far as depth of field, is there a big difference between a camera using a Bayer filter compared to a prism-type camera? There's no effect by the Bayer filter, per se, but 4K cameras all use uh, PL mounts and larger sensors, and the larger sensor has a big effect on depth of field. Um, so yes, you 
you get a shallower depth of field with the larger sensor, which sometimes is very nice if you're doing a movie and you want to separate one character from another or pull focus. It's great to have shallow depth of field. But if you're doing a documentary or news shooting or sports, then you want to have large depth of field, and the smaller sensor is actually better. Yes? So in the uh, Simpy UHDTV study group, um, at frame rates below 120, you're still discussing, God help us all, maintaining the 1001 frame rate for uh, NTSC evolution. Uh, at 120 frames per second, they are pretty much decided we're not going to do 1001. Very, very nice. What this means, however, is every bit of content at all uh, produced right until this point in time is going to need to be interpolated to 120 as opposed to one suggestion just play it at 0.1% error and don't worry about it. What do you think about the viability of frame rate converting from 1,000 to 1 to 1,000? No problem whatsoever. Um, A, I do it all the time at the Metropolitan Opera. I send live stuff out that goes around the world. So we're shooting at 59.94 and we're distributing at 50.00. So we're uh, making that conversion. Um, but also in the early days of HD, when NHK was saying it should be 60.00, they had demonstrations of frame rate conversion, including one that showed a pendulum swinging back and forth in front of a grid, and no one could see the problem, but I thought, I think we made a mistake when we went to HD, and I hope we correct that mistake at this point. Any other questions? Charles. So you mentioned uh, some luminance numbers for displays. So my sort of standard number for consumer displays, just rule, my own rule of thumb is 320 nits. But you were suggesting a Samsung display, you, you said 450 to 900. Right. Is, your, is that your kind of favorite range for? I've been looking through the numbers that are available. And what I can see from the numbers is that seems to be the current range. And when Dolby did their demos of the two identical consumer monitors, they were two 900-nit uh, monitors. Wow. And they were set up for 900-nit flat field? Uh, that I couldn't tell you. Okay. Because it's important to remember that Dolby cannot do a 4,000-nit point flat field. It just can't do it. It doesn't have the power. But uh, I'm just trying to work out for myself what's the... Uh, maximum conceivable consumer flat field white. And you're suggesting it could be a lot higher than 320 minutes. Well, I'm not necessarily suggesting that that's flat field, but I'm also saying that flat field might not be what's so important because what Dolby is showing is that the speculars are really amazing. Right. And the speculars are little tiny parts of the field. Even on their 4,000 nit monitor, they're not showing anywhere near a, a flat field. They're showing uh, chrome on cars and on aircraft engines and things like that. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks. One up there. Somebody around the same? Yeah. Uh, on the Honda Kino, there are a lot of people complaining about high frame rate looking fake or natural. I mean, we'll say, do you think that was unfounded? Or? I don't think it was unfounded. Um, my question is how much it is a, an effect of a generation. Um, but it's something that's been done in movies for a long time in lots of different areas. Let's say we have a scene where someone's looking through binoculars. Now, if you look through binoculars and the binoculars are set up properly, it looks the same as what you normally see. At worst, maybe you'll see a little bit of roundness. But the figure eight is the standard trope for, ah, someone is looking through binoculars. Or if you hear someone on telephone call, for many years now we've had uh, telephone calls that don't have any frequency response limitations. But the standard telephone call from the old analog era was between 300 and 3500 hertz. And so uh, here I am on the telephone talking to you. Um, and that's another trope that's done in movies. So it may be that for suspension of disbelief, we decide that some lower frame rate with motion judder is appropriate. Um, but maybe we don't want to see that in sports, and maybe we don't want to see that in news shows. 
it's a tool that the directors will have. The other possibility is because all of us in this room grew up with 24 frame per second movies, um, we, we expect that in the movies and so we go to The Hobbit and we say that doesn't look right. That doesn't look the way that I've seen it. Uh, I think we're going to have to wait to find out what the result is on that. Last question. So just to follow uh, Charles' question uh, where he responded that uh, it was the specters where they were delivering 4,000 nits uh, but not for flash. So does that result then in a visual AGC effect as APL goes up? No. Um, the, the speculars are so small that it really doesn't affect the APL very much. Sure, but if you pan up to the sun... Oh, yeah, if you were going to do that. So I'm just wondering, as the APL rises, is there the opportunity then for, for a, a noticeable AGC effect to, to contrast? It would depend on how the display was made. Thank you all. Thank you, Mark. <laughs>